I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Today, I'm going to continue talking about the various Olympians with an episode on Apollo. Originally in Greek, his name was Apollon, with an N at the end, but the N was later dropped, and the Latin version of his name is Apollo, which is so close to Apollon that most people just assume that the Greek and Latin versions are exactly the same. For ease of use, I'll just call him Apollo. Apollo is one of the most complicated of all the Greek gods. He was a god who had many different responsibilities, and gained more over time. Apollo was also widely worshipped throughout ancient Greece, which is also perhaps ironic, as in the myth of the Trojan War, he always worked against the Greek armies. Apollo was one of the second generation of Olympians, being a son of Zeus, and was born after the Titanomachy was already over. Apollo's birth is the subject of one of the particularly longer Homeric hymns, so let's start at the very beginning, with Leto, the mother of Apollo, and his sister, Artemis. Leto was a titan, the daughter of Koyos and Phoebe, and she is one of the younger generation that did not side with Kronos in the Titanomachy. Like some of her other fellow female titans, she became a lover of Zeus. The poet Hesiod lists Leto as one of the lovers Zeus had before marrying Hera. However, most of the myths that feature Leto giving birth to Apollo also feature Hera making life difficult for her, or trying to avoid the birth. Apollodorus's library also specifically calls out Hera, saying that she hunted Leto across the earth before the titan gave birth. So, the dominant tradition is that Apollo and Artemis are the result of one of Zeus's extramarital affairs. The Homeric hymn explains that Leto traveled far and wide, looking for a place where she could give birth to her son. She visits sites all across ancient Greece, Athens, Crete, Naxos, Miletus, Thrace, and many others. The different lands in this hymn are all personified, and they tremble with fear at the idea of being the birthplace of Apollo. They seem to fear the infant in some way, perhaps because he is destined to be a powerful son of Zeus. It could also be because they fear the wrath of Hera. Finally, Leto arrives on the island of Delos, and she tries to get the island to agree to host Apollo's birth with these words, Delos, if you would be willing to be the abode of my son shining Apollo, and make him a rich temple, no other will touch you. Leto goes on to say that Delos will never be a rich island, as there are no sheep or oxen. The island is not a good place to grow crops or fruit, but if Apollo is born there, a temple will be built there, and men will come from far and wide to visit it, and they will bring Delos riches and sacrifice to savor. Delos does agree, but provides some conditions, which perhaps explains why the other locations were so hesitant about being Apollo's birthplace. Delos says that people say Apollo will be a haughty great lord of gods and men, and that Delos fears that as soon as Apollo is born, he will scorn the island, use his feet to push the island down to, into the depths of the sea, and leave for another place that he likes more, and simply build his temple there. And instead of being a site of great sacrifices, Delos will only become the home of seals, octopus, and other sea creatures. To console Delos, Leto makes the most sacred and unbreakable oaths a god can make. She swears to heaven and earth, and by the river Styx, that Apollo's temple will be built on Delos. So Leto goes into labor on Delos, and it is a difficult labor. The Homeric hymn says it lasts nine days and nine nights. During that time, the other goddesses visit her, the titans Rhea, Themis, Dione, Amphrytrite, the sea goddess and wife of Poseidon, and all the rest— only two did not come, Hera, who stayed away, and Hera's daughter Aletheia, the goddess of childbirth, who was tricked by Hera to not attend. In fact, this is the reason for Leto's difficult birth, that the goddess of childbirth is not present. The goddesses who did come to Delos recognize this, and they send Iris, the messenger goddess of the Olympians, to go find Aletheia and bring her to Delos. When Aletheia arrived at Delos, Leto was finally able to give birth. Apollo entered the world, and the assembled goddesses washed the infant and wrapped him in white and put gold metal bands around him. Instead of having his mother Leto breastfeed him, Themis feeds Apollo nectar and ambrosia, the food of the immortals. After eating, the baby Apollo breaks the gold metal bands by flexing his muscles and says his first words, The lyre and the curved bow shall be ever dear to me, and I will declare to men the unfailing will of Zeus. Not too shabby first words, I think most people just say, Dada. I believe this is the oldest recorded version of Apollo's birth myth, 
There are a muddy array of other versions, though. Typically, Apollo's sister Artemis is born first, and replaces Aletheia as Leto's midwife. Myths from the later Greek and Roman periods also differ a lot more. Sometimes the location and the circumstances of Apollo's birth are completely different. In these, Leto is not able to find a birthplace for Apollo and Artemis because Hera has forbidden her from giving birth on solid ground. For that reason, she needs an island, and Poseidon brings Delos to her. Some even later sources, from around 100 or 200 AD, say that Leto was in the form of a female wolf, or was at least accompanied by wolves, when she was pregnant and came to Greece from Hyperborea, a strange land in the far north. It's not really clear what the connection between Apollo and Hyperborea is, but we do know is actually very ancient, and was known much earlier too, even in 700 BC, and that's a difference of about 900 years. At the end of the Homeric hymn, the baby Apollo says that the bow will be sacred to him, and this is very much one of his symbols. Remember that this myth is given as a hymn. That means it's a story of Apollo's birth, but the audience is intended to be Apollo. The hymn is being sung by his worshippers as a way to adore him. Throughout the hymn, again and again, we get lines like, O oh, far-shooting Apollo. He's very much described as an archer god. There are many stories of him killing giants with arrows, but something very interesting about Apollo's arrows is that he uses them to deliver plagues. In the story of the Trojan War, Apollo uses his arrows to cause sickness throughout the Greek armies. In the Homeric hymn, another weapon is also used in connection with Apollo. In two instances, he is described as the bearer of the golden sword. It's said in a way that sounds important, but I have no idea how this sword might be special. It's not clear in any of the surviving myths. Apollo was also the Greek god of music. His instrument of choice was the lyre, and this looks kind of like a small harp. You hold it in one hand and pluck strings with the other hand. As a god of music, Apollo is a master musician, and he gets in a few contests with others over who plays their instrument best. In one case, a satyr, a half-man, half-goat creature named Marcius, is particularly skilled at playing the olos, a type of flute. There are a couple versions of this story, but in essence, Marcius challenges Apollo to a contest of skill, and the winner can do whatever they want to the loser. Marcius plays well, and works spectators and the muses themselves into a frenzy with his playing. But Apollo is always crowned the victor. In one version, Apollo adds singing to his performance with the handheld lyre, something Marcius can't do when he's busy blowing into a flute. In another version, Marcius actually wins the first round, but in the second round, Apollo flips his lyre upside down and can still play perfectly. Again, an impossible task for the flute playing Marcius. So, Apollo wins. And what does he make Marcius do? Well, Apollo has Marcius flayed alive. The satyr's skin was nailed to a tree, and all of this was done as punishment for Marcius daring to think he could beat a god. Between the arrows causing plagues and his flaying of Marcius, it's clear that you don't want to get on the bad side of Apollo. At the end of the Homeric hymn to Apollo, Apollo says he will declare to men the unfailing will of Zeus. What does that mean? It refers to Apollo's association with prophecy. Some of the other Greek gods do provide prophecies, but in the classical Greek religion, Apollo was the main one. You can read that line at the end of the Homeric hymn as Apollo's own prophecy about himself. He is in essence foretelling what his powers are going to be. There are other Homeric hymns to Apollo that further explain how he got the responsibility over prophecy. The Homeric hymn to Hermes has a short section that talks about Apollo's childhood. It says that when Apollo was a child, three sisters with wings, implied to be bees, whisper truths to Apollo after eating honey, and falsehoods after being starved of it. So in this case, Apollo's powers of prophecy come from bees, which was actually one of many methods used by people to try and tell the future in ancient times. On the other hand, the Homeric hymn to Pythian Apollo tells how Apollo played his lyre among the gods, and then one day left Olympus to establish an oracle for mortal men. He traveled far and wide, going where, at the time, no men lived, going to a grove sacred to Poseidon, and arriving in a place called Telfusa. Now, Telfusa is a place, but in the hymn, it behaves like a person, a lot like the island Delos did in the hymn about the birth of Apollo. Telfusa tells Apollo that the sounds of horses and chariots there will annoy the god. Telfusa recommends building the temple in a place at the bottom of Mount Parnassus, in a completely different part of Greece. When Apollo arrives at Mount Parnassus, he declares that he will build a great temple to serve as an oracle, that people will bring great offerings to sacrifice at the temple, the hymn calls them hecatoms, and the sacrifices were originally a hundred oxen each, 
Apollo declares then that people will come from all across Greece to question him, and he will give them counsel in the temple. So Apollo sets to work building the temple along with countless tribes of people who are there to join him. Sounds good, but Apollo is about to run into some serious trouble. Near the site of the temple, there was a spring, and there lived a female serpent, a fierce monster, a dragon. I've actually talked about this dragon before. In the Hera episode, I talked about how Hera gave birth by herself to the god Hephaestus, and a monster called Typhon. The monster child Typhon was given to a serpent monster to be raised. This is the same serpent hiding out near Apollo's temple. The dragon serpent was said to bring doom to whoever met her, and its presence there makes the temple unapproachable. But Apollo is an archer, and is able to shoot arrows from afar. With his arrows, Apollo kills the dragon. With the temple secure, Apollo then decides he needs people to serve him in this temple. His god senses must have been tingling, because he becomes aware of a Cretan ship sailing in the ocean far away. They must have been some great, well-rounded sailor, because Apollo decides that they would be perfect to staff his temple. So he transports himself to where they are, and takes the form of a dolphin, he jumps onto their ship, and lies on the deck. The sailors try to remove the dolphin and throw it overboard, but Apollo makes the ship shake so the sailors sit in fear, sail on, and wait to see if the dolphin will jump back into the ocean. But soon the ship begins to become uncontrollable, and seemingly sailing by itself, the ship travels all around Greece. When the ship approaches the temple at Parnassus, Apollo leaps from the ship, flames and brightness flashing from him, and he goes to his temple. And then, he leaves the temple in the form of a man, and greets the ship. Pretending he has no idea who they are, Apollo calls the sailors strangers, and asks who they are, and why they are there. The sailor captain recognizes that Apollo is not like other mortals, and that he is instead like one of the deathless gods. He tells Apollo they don't know where they are, and that their ship came there without their control. Then he says this, One of the deathless gods brought us here against our will. Does he know it is Apollo? I think that if your ship sailed without your command and brought you to a temple where a literal god is just hanging about, it would probably be a good indication that he was the one that brought you there. Well, Apollo, to his credit, does come clean to the sailors. He introduces himself as Apollo, a son of Zeus, and says they will not return to Crete. Apollo says he brought them here over the wide gulf of the sea, meaning them no harm, and that they should work in Apollo's temple, and the sailors will know the plans of the deathless gods, and be honored continually for all time for their service. So, the sailors unpack their ship, build an altar to Apollo, and pray to him as Apollo Delphinus, as he was in the form of a dolphin previously. Apollo then takes them to his temple under Mount Parnassus, a site called Pytho, and gives them instructions to slaughter sheep continually as sacrifices, to guard the temple, and to receive the groups of people that will come to the temple asking for the wisdom of Apollo. This myth gives an account of how Apollo founded his temple at Delphi. Delphi was a very old sacred site in ancient Greece. It was likely the site of several temples, gradually built over each other, and the ruins could reach all the way back to Mycenaean Greece in 1400 BC. The Pythian Temple, the most famous version, was built near the beginning of ancient Greece's archaic period. It's actually referenced a couple times in Homer's Iliad. Since the Iliad was probably written around 800 BC, we have some evidence that the Pythian Temple of Apollo was already active at that time. This Temple of Apollo at Mount Parnassus is probably one of the most famous locations in ancient Greece. In the Temple of Apollo lived the Pythia, or the Oracle of Delphi, and people came from all across the Greek world to hear prophecies told by the high priestess that lived there. People came to see the Oracle all the way up to the year 400 AD, when it was closed by a Christian Roman emperor. With all of that, we get a few different myths that give details on the importance of Delphi, and they're not entirely consistent. As you've just heard in the Homeric hymn, Apollo killed a female dragon at Mount Parnassus and built a temple there. The name Delphi seems to be related in some way to the name Apollo Delphinus, referring to Apollo turning into the dolphin to get the sailor's attention. This hymn is believed to have been written in the 500s BC. Related to this, we have another source, a Greek playwright named Apollonius living in the 300s BC, and he says that Apollo killed a female serpent with his bow at Parnassus, agreeing with the Homeric hymn. But Apollonius names the serpent Delphini, so we have another origin story here for the name Delphi. But what about Pythia? Pytho, in these versions, refers to the specific location at Mount Parnassus, where Apollo built his temple at the place where the female serpent's corpse rotted in the sunlight. So in this case, the words Delphi and Pythia refer either to Apollo as a dolphin or to the serpent Apollo killed. 
But if we go a few hundred years later, during the Hellenistic period of ancient Greece and into the Roman times, we begin to see a new version of the myth. In these versions, Apollo does not slay a female serpent. Instead, he slays a male serpent named Python. The name Python here gives us Pythia. So it seems here we have a muddling of different myths explaining the foundation of the Temple of Apollo, using different word origins and different circumstances to explain them. Some archaeologists suggest that the switch to a male serpent is actually due to another myth. Remember the one about the monster Typhon being given to the female serpent to raise? We'll talk about Typhon later, but he is considered a monster because he has snakes for legs. If a bard, say, mixed these two serpent monsters up, you can see where the idea of Apollo killing a male serpent came from. In other words, they may have been talking about Typhon by mistake instead of the Delphini monster. Now, if you're not lost already, get ready for something else. I've already told you that Typhon was a son of Hera, but in other myths, he is said to be the son of Hera's grandmother, Gaia, the Mother Earth herself. But what does that have to do with Delphi? Well, remember I said there were other temples at Delphi? Well, as it turns out, there is archaeological evidence that before the Temple of Apollo was at Delphi, the area was sacred to Gaia. In fact, the Greeks may have even known this throughout their history. A famous Athenian playwright named Aeschylus even mentions that Apollo took it over from Gaia in one of the plays he wrote. Before we move on, I just want to add one more thing about Delphi. Besides being a place of prophecy, Delphi was considered the center of the universe by ancient Greeks. There was a monument called the Omphalos there, a big rock with interesting etchings on the side, and this was displayed there during ancient times. There are two stories of the origins of this rock. Remember when the titan Rhea tricked Kronos into swallowing a rock instead of the infant Zeus, and later Kronos vomited up the Olympians? The rock was regurgitated as well. That rock sailed through the air and landed in Delphi. The other story is that one day, Zeus set out to determine the center of the world. He had two eagles start flying from opposite sides. The Greeks believed the earth was flat, and where the eagles met, Zeus placed a stone. Again, the stone that's at Delphi. Before we leave off on Apollo, I want to talk about some of his other responsibilities. In addition to causing plagues with his arrows, there is a completely different side to Apollo. He is also a god of healing, and able to heal with those same arrows too. This ties Apollo in with two other healing gods. Paean is the physician of the gods in some of the earliest sources of Greek mythology. At two points of the Iliad, he heals the gods Ares and Hades after attacks by mortals. The name Paean appears in some of the few texts archaeologists have from Mycenaean Greece, so we're talking about a very old, very ancient god here. Later in the Greek period, though, this name is used as a descriptive name for Apollo. Presumably, by that time, the figure of Apollo had been fused with the separate god Paean. The other healing god associated with Apollo is Asclepius. He had his own Homeric hymn, although it is only a few lines long. It basically says that he is the son of Apollo and a human princess named Coronis. So Asclepius is a demigod, half god and half human, putting him in the same category as most of the Greek heroes. Songs by an archaic age poet Pindar, who lived around 500 BC, share some more details about Apollo's son. Apollo got his lover Coronis pregnant with a child, but she had also slept with another mortal man named Ischius. Because Apollo had his prophetic powers, he knew about Coronis's infidelity and shot Ischius with arrows. Cronus died too after being struck by the arrows of Artemis while in childbirth. Later, when a funeral pyre was lit to burn Coronis's body, Apollo walked into the flames and cut the unborn baby out of his mother's dead body. This baby, Asclepius, would go on to learn all the arts of healing and medicine, Later sources from the classical, Hellenistic, and Roman periods provide us with expanded myths for him. In those, Asclepius used those newfound powers of medicine and began to cure diseases even when people were on the point of death. There is even one story of Asclepius bringing a man back to life and being rewarded with gold by the goddess Artemis, Apollo's sister. Eventually, though, Asclepius' unnatural powers got the attention of Zeus. There are numerous sources, Hesiod, Pindar, Apollodorus, and others who say that Zeus zapped him with a thunderbolt. One Greek writer named Diodorus claimed that this occurred after Hades complained he was being robbed of subjects for his underworld realm. As it happens though, Apollo was very upset with the death of his son. He ended up taking revenge against Zeus by killing the cyclopses that forged the lightning bolts Zeus used as weapons. In response, 
Zeus banished Apollo from Mount Olympus, and had him placed as a servant for a human being. How Zeus continued to have lightning bolts made after Apollo killed the Cyclopses is not clear. In addition to Coronis, Apollo had a number of human lovers. Some of these lovers became the mothers of heroes. Some of them knew who Apollo was, and others he appeared to in disguise. Apollo also had divine lovers as well. He was apparently a lover of all nine muses, and possibly also the titan Hecate. Apollo was also involved with a number of nymphs. Again, a number of their children became human heroes, or people who were gifted with music. A few of the nymphs tried to escape from Apollo, and he either chased them down or kidnapped them. In this way, Apollo is similar to his father Zeus. So, there you have it. As you can see, Apollo was a little bit of a god of everything. In archaic Greece, he was mostly a god of prophecy and archery, but also of music. In earlier times, Apollo was closely associated with healing. His arrows were believed to bring disease to those he shot with them. In the Mycenaean period, and in the Homeric epics, there is the medicine god Paean. It's not clear if this was a healing god Apollo under a different name, or was a separate god that was absorbed by Apollo. Regardless though, the name Paean eventually became an epithet of Apollo. In the classical and Hellenistic periods, Apollo gained a responsibility over light, too. He even ultimately replaced Helios as the driver of the sun chariot. But in the everyday ancient Greek religion, Apollo was also an important protector god, and worshippers called on him to protect them from disaster and to keep away evil. Picking up on the fact that Apollo had so many different functions, his temples were sometimes dedicated to particular variations of his cult. For example, the Temple of Delos was dedicated to Apollo, but the Temple of Delphi was dedicated to the Pythic variation of Apollo. Different regions also likely worshipped Apollo in slightly different ways. So, Apollo was very fluid in terms of function within the ancient Greek religion. And in fact, he may have always have been like this. Scholars have several theories for the origins of Apollo. He may have had Mycenaean roots with the medicine god Paean, but there are also theories that his cult originated in Anatolia, today what is now Turkey. Evidence for this theory is possibly being reflected in the Iliad's very anti-Greek but pro-Trojan Apollo. In that epic poem, the god Apollo is on the side of the Trojans, and spends the entire poem making the lives of the Greek soldiers miserable. And of course, there are other theories too. The thing is, any of these could be wrong, or more than one could even be right. In myth, gods are kind of like microorganisms. They grow, they split apart, and they sometimes then go on and engulf or absorb other ones too, and combine together. Throughout all of that, their names and stories change, and something like that probably happened with our Greek god of everything, the far-shooting Apollo. And that's all for today. Next episode, I'll continue with another second-generation Olympian, Apollo's sister, the goddess Artemis. If you're enjoying this podcast, get the word out and share it with a friend. 